Good day and welcome to Home Street's third quarter 2021 earnings call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. If you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Please note that this event is being recorded. I'd like to turn the call over to Mr. Mark Mason, Chairman and CEO. Please go ahead. Hello, and thank you for joining us for our third quarter 2021 earnings call. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that our detailed earnings release and an accompanying investor presentation were filed with the SEC on Form 8K yesterday and are available on our website at ir.homestreet.com under the News and Events link. In addition, a recording and a transcript of this call will be available at the same address following our call. Please note that during our call today, we may make certain predictive statements that reflect our current views and expectations about the company's performance and financial results. These are likely forward-looking statements that are made subject to the safe harbor statements included in yesterday's earnings release, our investor deck, and the risk factors disclosed in our other public filings. Additionally, reconciliations to non-GAAP measures referred to on our call today can be found in our earnings release and investor deck available on our website. Joining me today is our Chief Financial Officer, John Mitchell. John will briefly discuss our financial results, and then I'd like to give an update on our results of operations and our outlook going forward. John? Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. In the third quarter of 2021, our net income was $27 million, or $1.31 per share, as compared to net income of $29 million, or $1.37 per share in the second quarter of 2021. Our annualized return on tangible common equity for the third quarter was 15.6%. Our annualized return on average assets was 1.48%, and our efficiency ratio was 62.8%. Our net interest income in the third quarter was slightly lower than the second quarter due to a $1.7 million decrease in interest income derived from PPP loans which was partially offset by higher levels of non-PPP loans. PPP loans caused our net interest margin to be higher by 11 basis points. Excluding the impact of PPP loans, our net interest margin in the third quarter of 2021 was consistent with our net interest margin in the second quarter of 2021. As of September 30th, 2021, outstanding PPP loans were $77 million with deferred fees of $2.4 million. As a result of the continued favorable performance of our loan portfolio and the improving outlook of the impact of COVID-19 on our loan portfolio, we recorded a $5 million recovery of our allowance for credit losses in the third quarter of 2021. As we continue to have more clarity of the minimal impact COVID is having on our loan portfolio, and with projected improvements in our economies, we expect to recover additional amounts of our allowance for credit losses in future periods. Our ratio of non-performing assets to total assets improved to 26 basis points. Our ratio of ACL to total loans was 1.06%. The $3.8 million decrease in net gain on loan origination and sales activities in the third quarter of 2021, as compared to the second quarter of 2021, was due primarily to a lower volume of single-family mortgage rate locks and lower levels of CRE loans sold in the third quarter. The 0.9 million decrease in non-interest expense in the third quarter, as compared to the second quarter, was primarily due to lower compensation costs, which were partially offset by higher general administrative and other expenses. The $3.2 million decrease in compensation costs was primarily due to reduced commissions, resulting from lower levels of loans closed in our single-family mortgage operations, and lower benefit costs due to third quarter seasonality. General, administrative, and other costs increased due to a $1.9 million reimbursement of legal costs received from our insurance carrier in the second quarter of 2021 and higher marketing costs. During the third quarter of 2021, we repurchased 2% of our outstanding common stock at an average price of $40.26 per share and declared and paid a dividend of 25 cents per share. Since the beginning of 2021, we have repurchased 7% of our outstanding common stock. 
This is in addition to the 12% and 9% repurchase in 2019 and 2020, respectively. I will now turn the call over to Mark. Thank you, John. Home Street's results for the third quarter continued our outstanding results for the year. Our results reflect our diversified business model, the benefits of our conservative credit culture, and continuing focus on operating efficiency. Our loan origination levels remain strong with $804 million of originations, and excluding the impact of PPP loans, and despite continuing high levels of prepayments, our total loans grew at an annualized rate of 19% during the quarter, and 9% year to date. As expected, our single family mortgage loan volume and profit margins decreased from second quarter levels, and our revenue has now declined to near normal levels. The credit quality of our loan portfolio continued its strong performance. As John mentioned, greater clarity on the impact of COVID on our portfolio allowed us to recover $5 million of our ACL. For the second consecutive quarter, our mortgage banking revenue comprised only 17% of total revenue and less than 8% of our net income. We continue to anticipate a slight decrease in our origination and gain on sales activities over the next few quarters. Due to increasing revenues from other operations, we expect the revenue contributions from our single family mortgage banking business to represent an even smaller share of total company revenue going forward. We expect our overall net interest margin to continue to benefit in the fourth quarter of 2021 from the forgiveness of PPP loans. Looking forward, with the Federal Reserve indicating that short-term interest rates will remain low for the foreseeable future, we expect our net interest margin, excluding the impact of PPP loans, to remain level as the benefit of our deposits continuing to reprice downward is expected to offset any decline in the yields on our portfolio loans. As I have mentioned previously, we continue to increase our commercial real estate loan originations, primarily multifamily, both for sale and for our portfolio. The strong fundamentals and demand in our markets and our successful platform have supported this initiative. These continuing high levels of loan production are expected to result in 10 to 15% growth in our loan portfolio next year and beyond, with a commensurate increase in net interest income. Our efficiency ratio in the third quarter was consistent with the prior quarter at 62.8%. While the expected decline in mortgage banking profitability is likely to result in upward pressure on our efficiency ratio through mid next year, we anticipate that as a result of loan portfolio growth and related increases in net interest income and our ability to leverage our existing operating infrastructure, we have the opportunity to improve our efficiency ratio to approximately 60% in the second half of next year and ultimately to the mid to high 50% range beyond that. Based upon our continuing strong financial results and positive outlook, we repurchased $15 million of our common stock during the quarter and paid a 25 cent per share dividend, which today equates to a yield of approximately 2.3% on the market value of our common stock. We anticipate continuing to efficiently retain capital for growth while returning excess capital to shareholders. In that regard, and subject to our board of directors review and approval and the non-objection of our regulators, we, ran, we plan on repurchasing $20 million of our outstanding shares in the fourth quarter. Additionally, given our consistently strong performance, the Board of Directors anticipates discussing an increase in our dividend in the first quarter of next year. Of course, future declarations of the current or higher levels of dividends are subject to our financial condition and future outlook at that time, as well as corporate governance, legal, and regulatory requirements. Last quarter, we disclosed that we were evaluating the use of securitizations as a tool to enable us to originate multifamily permanent loans to our full potential, to uncap individual borrower lending limits, and to improve our capital efficiency 
and retain the servicing on these loans, and that we planned on completing our first securitization this year. While we continue to evaluate the use of securitizations, we have instead agreed to execute a whole loan sale in the fourth quarter due to extremely favorable prices available in the secondary market today. Looking forward to 2022, we expect lower levels of portfolio loan sales, either through whole loan sales or securitization, as we plan to retain loans in our portfolio to generate increasing levels of net interest income. Since going public in 2012, Home Street has been executing a strategy to convert from a legacy thrift to a full service commercial and consumer bank. This conversion focused on the development of commercial lending and deposit product lines, and more recently, reducing the size of our single family mortgage banking business. S&P has recently recognized our successful conversion, and Home Street's Global Industry Classification Standard Code will be changed from a thrift and mortgage finance institution to a regional bank effective as of November the 1st of this year. This change may qualify Home Street for inclusion in certain regional bank indexes that currently exclude us. To reiterate my comments from last quarter, the, investment we have, the investments that we have made and the improvements in our efficiency and profitability have provided us with the operating leverage that will enable us the opportunity to grow revenue and in turn earnings without commensurate additions to personnel or other operating expenses. And while quarter to quarter earnings may show some degree of volatility, excluding recoveries of our allowance for credit losses and excluding non-recurring items, such as PPP loans and expense recoveries, and of course, subject to any unforeseen changes in the economy and our business, we believe we have the opportunity to continue to grow year over year earnings per share over the next few years. Specifically, we believe that current estimates understate our possible earnings per share over the next few years. Given our performance in relation to peers and my forward-looking comps today, I believe our stock is significantly undervalued. Today, we trade at a meaningful discount to our peers on a price-to-earnings or tangible book value basis. Specifically, Based upon multiples of 2022 consensus earnings estimates, today the median of our peers trade at over 30% higher than Home Street. Historically, this discount was largely attributed to high levels of mortgage banking revenues and earnings and its associated volatility. Historically, this was accurate, with mortgage banking revenues exceeding 50% of total revenues. However, even at the height of last year's mortgage refinancing, our mortgage banking revenues never exceeded 32% of total revenues. And the last two quarters of mortgage banking revenue represented only 17% of revenues and less than 8% of the bottom line. Today, any meaningful discount associated with mortgage banking volatility is unwarranted. And I believe our shares represent a tremendous opportunity for investors. The best way for me to describe the current state of affairs at Home Street is that, while we are pleased to have achieved strong operating results and total shareholder returns over the prior decade, this is not the same Home Street of 10 years ago, nor is it the same Home Street of even three years ago. What we have been able to accomplish with our effective reorganization is to have brought the company to a place where we can expect to achieve lower earnings volatility higher operational profitability, and stronger earnings growth, all of which we believe should compare very favorably to our regional banking peers going forward. With that, this concludes our prepared comments today. We appreciate, appreciate your attention, and John and I would be happy to answer any questions you have at this time. Well, now I'll begin the question and answer session. Ask a question, you can press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. This time we'll pause momentarily to assemble the roster. 
first comes there. First question comes from Jeff Rulos, DA Davidson. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Hey Jeff. Hey Jeff. Question on the the, the gain on sale uh, projections in in 22. I, I you've got sort of flattish uh, fee income expectations. Just trying to see what that line item year over year. I, I, um, maybe you could just detail a little bit more what what you see with the gain on sale uh, item. Uh, obviously, we expect um, gain on sales of single family mortgage loans to decline from this year, right? I mean, earlier this year, we still had uh, much more meaningful levels of refinancing activity. So absent uh, a meaningful decline in mortgage rates, we are expecting the revenues uh, next year in the single family mortgage banking area to look a lot more like the second half of this year. So you can you can see there would be um, a, a, a noticeable decline in those revenues. Additionally, given my earlier statements that we are planning to sell less multifamily loans next year, either by whole loan sale or securitization, those revenues are expected to decline also. Um, we are expecting to continue to grow our multifamily Fannie Mae DUS business, and of course, those are all um, loan uh, sales securitizations. We're expecting those related revenues to rise. That mitigates those declines somewhat. But you you could foresee these revenues declining um, if you sort of mix up all of those comments uh, by you know 25 percent to say a third of of this year's gain on sale revenue for, for this year yeah so right. j just to add um the third the third quarter revenue numbers probably are pretty consistent from a single family perspective in terms of going forward and looking on a goal for basis should not be substantially different either up or down from that um the other thing i wanted to point out is as we go through in this mortgage banking revenues as our as the prepayment speeds decline we would expect some uptick in our loan servicing revenue on the single family mortgage side That's i'll said some of that yeah right yeah. it's it's counter cyclical I know, Jeff, you've looked at our results for a long time and seen that. Our servicing results have been pretty poor, and they always are during falling rates, right? High levels of prepayment, which create high levels of decay or amortization of servicing rights. Also, when looking at the, these third quarter results, um, we didn't have a multifamily loan sale, right? Right. So you really need to look at both third and fourth quarters to get um, a realistic run rate going forward. And as we mentioned, we've agreed to have a, a whole loan sale of multifamily loans in the fourth quarter um, at, at premiums that um, were sufficient to keep us from securitizing. So um, we're expecting that to be a strong loan sale. Gotcha. And just a housekeeping item, maybe, John, what, what were the PPP balances at, at quarter end? They were at $77 million, and the deferred fees were about two and a half. Um, our expectations are is that through the fourth quarter, there'll be continued some forgiveness activity, and then we don't expect anything materially to be affecting next year's results on the PPP side. Be small benefit. Gotcha. Other the, um, go ahead. Well, also, just kind of beyond the, the revenue question, we, we believe that revenue – loss is going to be um, um, made up by other revenue increases, you know, primarily greater net interest income. Um, and, um, you know, all of these things together, we believe, along with continuing repurchases, that um, we are not going to see a diminution in earnings per share next year, right. despite um, the, the broad estimates that exist today. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you look at our numbers, our expectations because of the declining balances this year due to PPP loans, is not only do we expect our our year over year balances to increase by 10 to 15 percent, but we expect our average balance of loans to increase by a similar level uh, next year also. And that 10 to 15 percent includes the loans held for sale. Uh, the uh, 10 to 15 percent, the loans held for sale tend to it would not include that from the perspective of going forward. Um, the loan sale for sale will, will kind of be more fluctuating, and historically we've been pretty consistent because we have a loan sale on a quarterly basis. 
in the future, that will be more fluctuating because we aren't going to necessarily do one on a quarterly basis going forward. So, right, the 10 to 15 percent is just loans held for investment. Okay, got it. And the 19 percent annualized loan growth in the quarter, did, did you include the help for sale piece? In yeah, that we did that, include the help again? for, yeah, because we did, if you look at the help for sale between the second quarter and the third quarter, there was a big jump because of reclassification. So to get that annualized number, we did include all the loans. Um, that's why we also included the loans for the whole year, and that run rate was 9%. That's why I want to make sure we're, we're clarifying to everybody what the growth is. But we have we have strong growth when you pull back the PPP loans in terms of our overall portfolio. Gotcha. Uh, thanks for clarifying. I'll, I'll step back. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Again, to ask a question, please press star, then one. Next question is from Steve Moss, B. Riley Securities. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. Hey, good Steve. morning, Steve. Maybe just following up on, you know, the loan pipeline being strong here. I hear you guys on, you know, multifamily originations, obviously, but kind of curious, you know, you saw some growth here in the quarter in construction um, and, and even, you know, other spots. Just kind of how are you thinking about the mix in terms of the uh, growth going forward? We have a very strong pipeline, uh, particularly in the commercial real estate area, the multifamily area. Um, obviously, in the single-family mortgage area, we're coming into the seasonally lower volume period, and the fourth quarter tends to be a period um, seasonally where you're, you're drawing down the pipeline. So we will exit the fourth quarter, at least in the single-family area, with a smaller pipeline than we enter. Uh, that may not be true um, in the commercial area. It sort of remains to be to be seen. Um, obviously, loan rates continue to be attractive, um, and um, in some areas, like the Fannie Mae Dust area, recent changes in um, the uh, lending caps for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in the multifamily area have spurred great originations there. The change in, in administration uh, has been good um, for the agencies in, with respect to multifamily lending caps. Those caps were increased about 10% from uh, the 2021 cap, and, um, and the agencies have become much more competitive uh, since those announcements. So we're expecting uh, much stronger agency lending um, through the end of the year and at least next year. And one other thing, too, is just our, our single-family loans originated for portfolio have been strong this year, and we continue to have pretty strong results next year. Just the level of prepayments have been so high this right. last year and a half that it's been hard to keep keep pace with it. We expect with pre prepayments going down next year that we expect our single-family portfolio to continue to actually just start growing next year. And it's been running off since we downsized the business. Right. 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 Exactly. Okay, that's helpful. And then in terms of just loan pricing, kind of curious as to, you know, where rates are in terms of what's coming on the, on the books these days versus what the, the rate of what is uh, rolling off. Well, I mean, that's still, <laughs> that, that condition hasn't changed, right? I mean, loans that are prepaid are prepaid for a reason, right? And so um, let me see if I can give you some some runoff note rates in the aggregate in the um, the third quarter. Um, let me pick up. That's what we originated at. Right. I'm looking for the runoff. The runoff um, is here. That one. Mark. We ran loans off. Actually, it, was, it, it appears balanced, but it's it's not really. In total. We ran off loans at about a 338 spread and replaced them with 339, but that's not true by category, right? If you look at, um, uh, for example, um, uh, single family loans, the loans that prepaid were 3.93% and the loans we added were 3.36%, right? I mean, that puts in perspective what happens with runoff. Yeah. Um, the one thing that's affecting this too is the PPP loans or some of the runoff we have, and so those loan rates were low at one percent. Right, that's what makes the aggregate low. Yeah. But in the the ongoing portfolios, the multifamily 
PERM portfolio uh, plus the non-residential CRE PERM portfolio. We ran off at 4.21% and we added at 322, right? So um, these trends continue. Uh, this is the same experience all of our peers are having. Fortunately, our funding costs continue to fall and um, in the aggregate, we're, we believe we're able to maintain our core net interest margin. Okay, that, that's helpful. And then in terms of, Mark, you talked about capital deployment going up to $20 million here, uh, likely on the buyback. Just kind of, you know, I, I, I take that to be your signaling, you know, sustained profitability, you know, closer to this quarter's current level. Uh, just kind of you know, curious on how you guys are thinking about it, especially as we think about 2022. Well, that's a great question. Um, we we have been fairly aggressive with our um, buyback program, though we have been careful during the pandemic to. Um, structure our buyback program uh, so that buybacks during the quarter have generally not exceeded what we've earned in the quarter in conjunction with dividends, total distributions, if you will. And we were sensitive to that relationship um, as the pandemic has extended to return, uh, to return, to maintain a somewhat higher level of capital than we would um, target in a normal course. And going forward, um, as the pandemic, <laughs> I'm crossing my fingers on this one, as the pandemic ends and doesn't extend, um, you, um, you may see us um, extend the buyback activity beyond um, current earnings in conjunction with dividends uh, that would have the impact of uh, reducing our capital ratios um, somewhat, uh, not significantly, but um, a little beyond current levels, which, which means that relative to capital earnings, our buyback program uh, may be slightly elevated. Okay, great, uh, that's helpful. Thank you very much in this quarter. Thank you, Steve. Great, thanks, Steve. This concludes our question and answer session. I'd like to turn the call back over. Mr. Mark Mason for final remarks. Please go ahead, sir. We appreciate, um, well, before we leave, we're, we're looking at the, uh, the queue. Does Jeff Rulist have another, another question? question? Are we looking at the queue wrong? Operator, can you check? A moment. Yes, I'll get him back in. Give me a moment, please. All right, our next question will be from Jeff Rolos. Follow up from DA Davidson. Please go ahead. Sorry, guys, uh, not to hold everyone up, but I just a quick question on the, on the EPS being understated. I think a big piece of expectations might be at least year over year 21 versus 22 is on the provision uh, you know year to date a, a nine million dollar recapture added it, it is are those are you excluding that in in that conversation just wanted to kind of get your sense and, and if you're including it i guess any expectations you have on the provision line for 22 are are relevant great and, and thanks for asking that question um we are anticipating um Again, absent changes in COVID-related risk or, or other credit risk, we are anticipating further drawdowns in our ACL next year. Um, if we realize uh, what I would consider a, a, a normal, a full normalization of that credit risk related to COVID next year. Uh, we would likely normalize our ACL levels or coverage levels, if you will, which would anticipate us uh, recovering uh, the remainder of provisions we established um, against 
um, pandemic-related risk, uh, offset by uh, growth in the portfolio, and um, whatever other adjustments we might feel are needed to adequately um, state our ACL uh, in relation to um, obviously the new standards. Um, but if you consider that um, we've had a growing uh, composition of multifamily loans in our held for investment portfolio and that potential impact on the ACL, uh, our ACL um, could end up at or slightly lower relatively to where we were pre-pandemic. Um, we have not had losses in multifamily loans as an institution, as a simple statement. And our relative credit risk, when you consider uh, our high composition of real estate related lending and the hard collateral, conservatively underwritten, that comes with it, um, we, we have a lot of safety in our ACL coverage. And so um, our next year's comments do um, contain the assumption that we will uh, recover all or substantially all of the pandemic uh, related um, uh, provisions from 2020 offset by portfolio growth. Yeah. Got it. So if you're growing loans 10 to 15% in 22, uh, we could see continued drawdown of reserves in 22, so be it that the provision line is a net benefit uh, versus that's, an expense. That's, yeah, absolutely. That, that's correct. Okay. Thank you, guys. You got it. Thank you. That will conclude our question and answer session. We'll go Mr. Mark Mason now for closing remarks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, operator. And thank you to everyone who joined us today for your attendance and patience and hearing our prepared comments and um, the great Q&A. We look forward to talking to you next quarter. Conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.